folks here are going to talk about um, work that they do with social media data um, uh, and their research. And hopefully that helps us um, as we're doing uh, social media archive. I can talk a little bit more about the work that we do as we build collections, build tools um, to, to, to support uh, that kind of work. So I'll turn it over to Ed. Thanks, Burgess. So I have one of those voices where I have to try to project it because I tend to speak softly. Um, so let me know if you can't hear me in the back. Um, so I, I thought I would start by just introducing myself. And I did, I must confess, I, I went to everybody's website and, and sort of got a little uh, you know, bit of information about you. Which I, So I was prepared to introduce you if you didn't want to, but the nice thing about uh, you know, chairing a panel of people that are used to uh, talking uh, professionally a lot is that um, I can sort of like lean on you guys to, to do that, I suppose. So e either way, I, I'm happy to, to read the, the bits of uh, uh, biographical information if you want. Um, I thought I'd just start with myself. Um, I'm a, a software developer working at the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. And um, I'm also working on this Documenting the Now project as, as a software developer. And, um, but this panel is, uh, is, is not really, I mean, there may be a bit of software development that comes into it, but in some ways I'm sort of out of my league here a little bit because I'm, I'm also a PhD student at the University of Maryland um, in the <coughs> iSchool there studying uh, web archives and uh, um, sort of like how people decide what to put into web archives. That's kind of how my, my uh, research is sort of, I mean, I, I'm at the beginning stage of what these people have already sort of gone through and, and, and achieved and built careers around. So uh, yeah, I, I have to admit I'm a little bit intimidated, but, um, but at the same time, I think that the thing that, as Burgess was saying, the thing that I'd like to try to get out of this discussion is um, you've all done interesting work sort of looking at the web and social media content, right? And, and done a lot of research. And so I, I guess I was hoping that we could spend some time um, sort of talking about that process and the work itself, um, sort of focused on that. Um, and I, I think, um, yeah, I've got a list of questions that I can definitely bring up, but, but I think, uh, at this point, maybe maybe for you guys to introduce yourselves, and and I apologize too. I haven't really talked to you about whether you have a presentation or not. So <laughs> if you do have something you want to present, that that's great. Um, but uh, if you don't, that's also great, and we can sort of roll with it from there. Um, but yeah, so Michael, you want to? So I'm Michael Nelson. I'm a professor of computer science in Old, at Old Dominion University. That's in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, of course, I have slides because I physically can't speak if there are no slides behind me. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> in planning to speak to you, I brought slides. So I'll talk about web archiving. I know we have a whole session about web archiving, but I want to talk about some of the issues really exiting from the previous panel and hitting into the web archiving panel. And I can say just uh, before we move on, like one of the things that Michael has done that is really well, one of the reasons why we invited him to be uh, on the advisory board here is because of his work uh, looking at social media and sort of how, so you're, uh, I love the, the article title, it's um, you know, Losing My Revolution, right? right. So looking at the, the way that, the, um, that, that social media sort of decays over time, right? And, and I think that that was part of the, the, the articulation for the documentary yeah, well, grant. But yeah, hopefully we can get talk about it a little that. bit. Yeah. Brooke? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Brooke Foucault-Wells. Thanks for coming back for lunch, from lunch. And hi to the folks on the live stream. Um, so I'm an assistant professor of communication studies and network science at Northeastern University. Um, you heard my co-author and colleague Sarah Jackson talk on the first panel this morning. Um, so you have some idea of what kind of work I do. Um, so I'm a computational social scientist. And I'm interested in particularly how the pathways of new media networks um, shape how people come to understand the world. Um, and there are a variety of different angles I've taken into that research, one of which, of course, is activism and how particularly marginalized voices um, find power through those pathways and those networks. 
Um, I can also talk to you a bit about how young folks um, come to understand who they're talking to on, uh, on social media networks. I think that it has potentially some relevance, um, particularly for conversations about who folks imagine their audiences to be when they are initially posting that tweet and who those audiences become over time. Um, you know, and, I, and I also um, have some more, uh, I guess, uh, technical background in the kind of statistics and things that we use in order to parse through both to create social media networks um, out of data that aren't inherently networked, um, and then also to parse through and find voices that might be interesting to attend to, or voices that we might not be attending to um, in, in ways that are mattering um, when we're thinking about putting together archives. So I'll stop there. Great. Uh, my introduction will be uh, somewhat shorter. Uh, my name is Dean Freelon. I'm an associate professor of communication at American University in Washington, D.C. And um, yeah, I think I'll just uh, uh, defer to talking about what uh, about my scholarly identity and what I do uh, for my actual presentation. <laughs> um, well, speaking of which, do you want to go first, Dean? Uh, is that that's no pro that's no problem. I can certainly do that since since uh, since you've uh, uh, settled on me. That's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's totally it's totally fine. No, Ed and I go way back. It's fine. Um, so so yeah, uh, when I think about my scholarly identity, I do a number of, of things, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, for these purposes, I describe myself as a scholar dash developer, um, and so what that means is that a number of uh, people who do research, quantitative research especially, rely on tools that other people have created. Um, a large portion of my scholarship relies on tools that I have created myself. And so the development piece of this is a major part of my research, um, in addition to actually using the tools that I create to explore, in my case, political expression um, and social movements. Uh, although what I really am interested in from a, a substantive and theoretical standpoint, um, in addition to social movements themselves, is the conversation that develops around social movements, right? So um, <clears throat> in uh, a recent report that was uh, published through the Center uh, for Media and Social Impact at American University with my colleagues, Meredith Clark, who was also on the advisory board but couldn't make it today, uh, who's at the University of North Texas, and uh, Charlton McElwain is at NYU. We, um, uh, so right, so in this report, we basically uh, use some of these tools that I've created to explore uh, these conversations and not only the, the movement itself, Black Lives Matter, but also the um, sort of hangers-on that they attract, which uh, in the aggregate is actually much larger than the movement itself. And we point out that when any movement speaks in a social media space, they attract a large number of people that are commenting on them, perhaps their allies, maybe the people that are slightly less engaged, and maybe they're passing this information also on to other publics that wouldn't necessarily uh, be aware of that sort of thing. And so that's a major way that this information moves from the movement uh, to um, places that uh, aren't necessarily paying attention to the issue that, tr that they're trying to spotlight. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so back to scholar scholarship slash development, which again is, is uh, what I do. I've looked at this in a number of contexts in addition to, uh, to Black Lives Matter, which um, we did the report on, and I'm prepping a number of other uh, studies that are going to be offshoots of that. Uh, I've looked at um, online political expression in the context of uh, youth civic engagement, which was some of my earliest work, and also uh, presidential campaigns. Um, actually, the 2012 campaign might do a study or two on 2016, but there's going to be a feeding frenzy there, so I have to figure out a really interesting uh, take on it. Um, I've also looked at um, some of the social media conversations in the Middle East, specifically in Syria and Egypt, during and after the Arab, sp Arab Spring with some colleagues uh, that I've worked with at George Washington University. So, um, so there's a lot of different places that you can, that this sort of scholar developer model can sort of take you. And um, I'll talk about that uh, uh, just a little bit. Um, so when I think about this in the context of a tool like DocNow, um, I don't necessarily see the absence of any particular research tool as an impediment. Um, I see it more as an opportunity. Um, and uh, for me, it's really great because I'm able to explore topics that are not able to be explored using pre-existing tools. And uh, this is, is a um, skill set and an ethos that I would love to pass on to other people, although uh, shockingly, I haven't had a number, uh, I haven't had a whole lot of disciples yet, which I, I really want to at some point. And so if you're interested in, in uh, learning how to do this, please talk to me. Um, but uh, I, I do think it's really important for people to 
uh, be able to look at a problem and say, wow, I really want to develop something uh, to address this particular problem because there are a lot of issues that I'm sure a lot of people uh, would love to be able to study, but they can't because the, the tools are not appropriate for them to do so. And so to be able to develop that, uh, to discover and um, to understand the particular research questions that you're interested in, I think is, is a really nice um, uh, uh, gift and just a general value add to your identity as a scholar. Um, at the same time, I don't really have a whole lot of interest in, in reinventing wheels. So, you know, I don't do this sort of as like a fetishistic type of uh, operation. You know, if there's somebody else who has developed a tool that does something really well, then I'll certainly use that. Um, so it shortens my workflow uh, and um, it does the same thing that I hope that uh, people get when I put my own software out there on an open source basis is they can use what I've developed uh, to help their research move a little bit faster. And, uh, and some folks here uh, uh, on this very advisory board have done just that. Um, so, uh, and that also speaks to the open source piece of this, which um, I don't know whether DocNow will technically be open source, but certainly it will be open access, hopefully. Um, I try to make my tool available to others. Um, one of the barriers to entry to some of my tools is you have to use code to be able to, to make, to, to do that. Um, some of them don't require code. I developed, um, while I was a graduate student, a tool to uh, calculate intercoder reliability for content analysis, which this has been used a bunch of times. Um, I also developed a tool that uh, uh, basically is used to, to analyze network data at a very large scale. Um, I'm, I mostly use it on Twitter data. It's out there on an open source basis. That one requires code. Uh, Recal, the intercoder reliability uh, uh, calculation engine doesn't. So some of them do, some of them don't. It just depends on kind of uh, uh, where I end up going with it. This is sort of another issue that, that goes along with this, right? I develop all these tools for my own use and then I put them out there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of an amateur as this goes, and so uh, if other people find them useful, that's great. Um, that may not necessarily always be the case. Uh, I'm not always able to take as thoughtful a process in the development as the folks uh, who are doing Doc Now uh, are doing, and I really uh, thank them for, for that. Um, let's see. So when I think about a product like this from my own uh, perspective and from my own use, um, you know, I, I really am looking for something that uh, I can integrate into my own workflow. And the best way for that to happen is to be able to make the raw data available. So some people who don't deal with code, if, you're, if you have a data set that has several million tweets or Facebook messages or what have you in it, um, you can't really interface with that except for using some sort of code on some level. Even if you want to analyze it qualitatively, you have to be able to, to, zoom, to zoom in on those posts that you really want to look at. And there aren't really ways of doing that um, except for uh, uh, by using code or, or very expensive analytics platforms. Um, and so making the raw data available is something that's really important to me and, I'm, and I expect to other uh, computational researchers. Um, I, I, did, I actually had the opportunity to take a really quick look at the uh, demo version of DocNow just this morning um, during, one of the during a, some of the sessions earlier and uh, I did see that it does have the capability of uh, exporting uh, raw data in JSON format, which is great. I really want to know how you got around the Twitter's terms of service to be able to do that because technically uh, Twitter, unfortunately, if you don't know this, uh, is really, really restrictive in terms of how it uh, permits people to share data sets. In, uh, in short, they don't do it, which is really problematic from the stance of people who want to learn how to do this work because getting the data, there are ways you can get it, but you have to know how to program uh, in most cases to be able to get the data in the first place. So it's sort of a, a bit of a chicken and the egg problem there. Um, and so, but, uh, but if there are ways to share this uh, in that way, that would be really nice. Um, I know, uh, I, I also think I saw that um, there's a capability to, ex to export the tweet IDs, which is really important. Um, one of the ways that uh, you can actually get around the Twitter's terms of service is to be able to take the unique IDs of each tweet and to do what's called rehydrating them, which means that you can't share the tweets themselves, but you can share their IDs. And if you have their IDs, you can pull the data back down uh, from Twitter to be able to reconstitute those tweets. The problem with that is uh, something called data attrition, which means that if you wait for a certain period of time uh, after the tweets have been posted, a certain number of them will disappear for various reasons. Sometimes people will lock their accounts. Sometimes they'll delete tweets. Sometimes their, their uh, accounts will be suspended. Um, and so uh, you end up with only a fraction of the tweets that were originally there because of the time lapse between when those IDs were collected and when you end up doing your rehydration process. And so anything that, uh, that DocNow or other similar tools can do to get around that particular problem would be, would be really nice. Um, so, uh, so that's great. Um, 
you know, some of the, the visualization pieces were really nice as well. Um, just very, very basic visualization that can help people get a sense of, for example, um, the number of unique users that are, uh, happen to be uh, active in a given um, data set, the number of people who are the most replied to, most retweeted, that sort of thing. Uh, excuse me. Um, longitudinal plots of uh, when tweet activity spikes and when it really, really plunges. One of the things that was mentioned uh, at the activist panel was uh, talking about some of the spikes that happened during the major events on the ground. So uh, during the initial Ferguson uprising and right around the time of Darren Wilson's non-indictment. And um, one of the, the panelists noted that between, uh, let's see, the end of August 2014 and the end of November 2014, the, there was a lull in activity. We saw that and we talked about that in our report. Um, and so just to be able to see that reflected the actual lull in media activity and external attention that those activists talk about, to be able to see that uh, as a plot, I think, really helps to validate some of their experiences, which of course is very important. Um, so yeah, oh, another, another uh, suggestion that I have for you is to, to, I don't know how you're collecting this data, but there are a couple of different ways you could do it. You could collect data on a rolling basis, right? So Twitter basically allows for listening apps to be created so that you can pull data down continuously. Um, if you can't do that, you also might uh, allow people, and actually this would be great retroactively, is allow people, I've talked to Ed about this as well, allow people to donate their data, their tweet IDs, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't share the tweets directly, but you can say, hey, uh, donate this data, give us your IDs, we'll reconstitute or we'll make them available, um, we'll tag them so people can uh, figure out how to get the, the information. This also helps to plug into uh, open source or open data requirements that some journals have. So some journals actually require you to um, place your data in an open source repository or sometimes they strongly encourage it. So this could be a good way of doing that. You say, well, we because of Twitter's terms of service, we can't um, just sort of present our data and put it out there publicly, but we did give our tweet IDs to DocNow, and so folks can look those up and, and reconstitute those uh, as their research projects warrant. Um, let's see, so that would be really great. Um, other stuff, uh, a lot of the visualization stuff I think will be really important for people who can't code, people who just want some very, very basic descriptive information about the data that's available. Um, you know, uh, I do, uh, my, my, also, my other hope is that with the export functions, that DocNow operates as kind of like a, uh, like a gateway drug, as it were, to um, more uh, code-intensive forms of analysis so that people can really, really answer those questions that just can't be answered by dropping code into, uh, by um, dropping data sets into sort of a preset platform and having it spit sort of the standard plots out. Um, and so I think that uh, the, to the extent that DocNow can do something like that, it would be a real boon to anybody who really wants to do quantitative social science research. Um, I'm going to stop there, and uh, we can talk about any of this that anybody is interested in uh, during Q&A. So. Thanks, Dean. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Probably That probably made you think of a bunch of questions, but maybe we could just keep going. Yeah. Uh, yeah Brooke, would you? Sure, I'm happy, I um, <clears throat> happy to go next. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, I am the kind of data wrangler behind a lot of the work that Sarah and I um, have done together on hashtag activism um, up to and including the book uh, proposal uh, and ultimate book uh, that we will keep you posted on. So follow us on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, uh, my entree into this is uh, some combination of tech skills. So I'd uh, say that I'm probably 10% more technically savvy than the average person in this room, but not like 100%, right? So just a touch. Um, and then also, if I'm being honest, uh, serendipitous access to data. So Northeastern, um, through a, a sort of historical accident, um, has a 10% a garden hose um, access to Twitter, the Twitter archive. Um, so if you don't know what that means, um, you should probably look it up. It's important that we um, start to be more transparent about who has access to data, who gets the data, the biases in the data that we get, which, which truthfully, I don't even fully know. Um, and I don't think anyone knows that's sort of Twitter's decision, uh, what 10% of the tweets we get. They say it's random, but there's some evidence that it's not. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's important to uh, make these things a bit more transparent and put them on the table so that we're all discussing them when we're talking about building tools and doing research and drawing conclusions about how the world is working uh, based on a set of data that we don't even fully understand. Um, so if I, if you'll indulge me a bit, um, I did come up with a sort of three pithy uh, headlines for uh, things that I think we ought to be thinking about today. Um, so uh, the first one is data storage is cheap, uh, but data usability is expensive. <sighs> Um, so, 
it's uh, now um, increasingly the case that it is cheaper to just store all the data we can get our hands on than it is to delete it um, or to sort it in any meaningful way. So data storage gets cheaper all the time. There are server farms uh, you know, in the mid Midwest, the Amazon Web Servers uh, are, are, are very affordable even for academics like me working on low budgets. Uh, so uh, the problem is that, as Dean alluded to, the, when the data come to us, um, it's sort of in this uh, you know, like gigantic text file uh, that's impenetrable um, to anyone who doesn't know how to code. Um, and even if you know how to code, it's impenetrable. Uh, you, know, you could sort of sort it into a spreadsheet, but that's not particularly useful um, in terms of understanding what to be paying attention to. There's a ton of noise um, in these data sets. So uh, you know, a lot of the work that I do um, when Sarah and I work together ultimately is rendered invisible um, in the final product. So you see these beautiful papers with these amazing conclusions, um, and the thing that I actually put in there happened beforehand. The text that I wrote is maybe three paragraphs okay? <coughs> um, in the methods section about where the data came from and how we uh, processed them and things like that with some references. Um, but I am, in fact, making a lot of decisions that we could argue are both political and ethical. Um, so it's my job to pick out the most important people. Um, and when we think about uh, you know, what do we classify as most important, we use a pretty um, widely used metric. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best one. Um, so we use the most, roughly speaking, the most retweeted um, is the kind of mathematics behind what we do. Um, but recently, we started working on a data set where that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so it's sort of a contested discussion that's happening. So we said, well, what if instead of looking at the people who are retweeted the most, which has some biases baked in, we look at the people with the most diverse audience. So they're being retweeted by the most diverse set of people. So they're actually reaching into parts of the network that other people aren't necessarily getting into. Um, so that's another decision. And that gets written into a sentence into the final paper um, that we're to write. So uh, I think the point here is not that we need to all be sort of mathematicians or network statisticians, but then we need to be aware that the folks who are doing that work are making decisions that fundamentally influences the way that we interpret uh, the results uh, that we present in these papers um, and, the work of, and the work that databases like these uh, might support. Um, so you might, um, in addition to sort of creating a set of ethics around data use and data access, you might also consider uh, creating a set of ethics around sort of analysis or the transparency of the process. For example, it's not uncommon for folks to be required to post the code um, that they used in order to do uh, the data processing. It's one possibility. All right, uh, pithy statement number two. Uh, uh, there's a trade-off between parsimony and inclusivity. So a couple years back, I wrote this paper that was uh, sort of, it was a feminist critique of big data research. It was pushing back on the idea that we should always be looking at the kind of statistical norm or the statistical average or the statistically most prominent. Um, because what that does is it has the effect of kind of masking the anomalies, the differences, the, the marginalized, and so on. Um, in platforms like Twitter, where uh, black users um, are plentiful, um, it doesn't necessarily correspond um, to marginalizing race. Um, but one can imagine quickly um, how it could, um, or what kinds of folks uh, become marginalized in those kinds of analyses. And I think uh, more so than the, the actual sort of argument about inclusivity, which is an important one, uh, the real tragedy here is that we have the opportunity to not replicate those problems in the past. In the past, I don't think that it's a valid argument, but it certainly is a true argument that it was difficult to find you know, trans uh, black folks in order to interview them um, and include or include in your surveys. It was difficult because they are statistically less regular in the population. Um, but now, it is foolish to make that same argument. Even if we can only find 5,000 or 10,000 tweets in a database, uh, we still have 5,000 or 10,000 statements made by these folks that we can analyze and include in our research record. Um, so there can be the temptation in order to manage data um, when it gets this big to just say, okay, let's focus on the folks either who gave us direct permission, um, you know, folks that we were aware of to ask. Um, let's focus on the folks who were the most retweeted, who appear the most 
often who also get mentions in mainstream news. I mean, there are a number of metrics that we can use, and we have to be awfully careful about replicating the kind of exclusions and biases that we have committed in the past simply because it's easier to find some people than others. Um, incidentally, data scientists sometimes refer to this as the stegosaurus problem. Um, so you know stegosaurus, the dinosaur? Does anyone have a seven-year-old? <laughs> I do. Um, so they're the dinosaurs with the big plates on the back. They're pretty spectacular. We've all seen uh, renderings of them. Many of us have seen their bones in museums. It turns out, uh, you know, and I didn't invent this uh, phrase, um, so I, I'm repeating, but it turns out that stegosauruses weren't actually that common, apparently. Stegosauruses just have big, heavy bones. Um, so we are both more likely to find them um, just uh, by random chance. Uh, and we are also, they're also more likely to have been preserved over time than the tiny little sort of mouse-like dinosaurs um, that just disintegrated um, into the earth. That doesn't mean that the mouse dinosaurs weren't important, right? Um, so we have a misrepresentation of uh, what history looked like, what it you know, looked like when dinosaurs were roaming the earth. We imagine these big monsters everywhere uh, when in fact there was lots of little tiny mouse dinosaurs scurrying around. And I think likewise, uh, when any time we use sort of big data social media analytics, uh, we have the problem of over-representing the kind of goliaths in those databases uh, because we are looking for them and they're easier to find. Um, so let's not commit that uh, fraud. Uh, so one, a uh, fantastic example from our own research. Um, Sarah already tweeted out the link to the Ferguson paper, uh, but one of the things we decided to do um, was look at who was influential and in sort of framing um, how Ferguson got represented. The first uh, analysis that I did created a network out of the first year of data. Um, and, and frankly, that story wasn't all that interesting. So it was, um, you know, it was a mainstream journalist, Wesley Lowry, and, and those folks who got some attention. They were, in fact, on the ground, and it sounds like Wesley does a great job of talking to the activists, so that's good news. Um, you know, and some other mainstream outlets, it, it, you know, it was just sort of like kind of who you would expect. It's like, this doesn't feel right to us. This doesn't feel like how this got started. So let's start chunking it down and down and down. So I did a month and then a week and then by the day. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only when we chose to focus in on that first day that we found the regular folks doing that reframing work that Sarah talked about this morning. Um, so neither story is wrong. I think that that is uh, why that example is so effective. It is totally true that the mainstream press and politicians picked up on the Ferguson story later on and promoted it in, inside the mainstream, right? It is also true that regular folks got that conversation started and there are lots of truths in between. Um, so I think if we, if we sort of sacrifice um, the little stories uh, for the big stories, right, we end up missing some of the dynamics on the ground. Now, of course, this speaks directly to the kind of scalability problem. So why do we need to collect a lot of data? Because if we don't collect a lot of data, we're unlikely to collect those tweets on the first day, right? Those are the first ones who get sacrificed. Um, all right, so, and then to that end, my third sort of pithy recommendation is about diversifying data. Um, so I think there are a few things uh, that we have already talked about. So diversifying voices, making sure we're representing not only academics and elites, but also the marginalized and the counter publics. I think some things we haven't talked about um, is uh, finding ways to collect the kind of specifications of the platform in the moment of time where the tweets or what, you know, whatever other data were collected. So 2014 Twitter was very different than 2009 Twitter, and it's very different than 2016 Twitter. We can only speculate at this point, but one of the things that Sarah and I get asked all the time is why was it Ferguson? Why was that the one um, that got so much attention? And we don't know because we can't do A-B testing on this sort of thing. But one of the things that was different about Ferguson was the combination of uh, the photos of Michael Brown. Um, he was out in the street for an excruciatingly long amount of time um, and his neighbors were tweeting out photos, which were devastating. And it just so happened that right prior um, to that happening, Twitter started integrating the photos right into the news feed. So you no longer had to click through to see the photo. It was right there in your face. Um, so again, only speculating. We can never prove because we can never go back in time um, and try it a different way. Uh, but uh, that does seem to be uh, an important detail to document when we're thinking about what did Twitter look like and why did this uh, sort of series of events happening. Um, and then uh, to just conclude and wrap up, I would also say that we've talked an awful lot about Twitter. Um, and you know, part of that is because a lot of social movement uh, sort of activity is happening on Twitter. But
But if I'm being really honest, part of that is also because Twitter data are easier to analyze, right? So they're largely text-based. They're already sort of formatted in a way that it's easy to draw out networks and things like that. It doesn't mean that things aren't happening on Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook um, or Pinterest or any of the other sites. Um, those sites are important too, but they either have terms of service that are difficult for our, us to engage with, um, so we can't get the data out, um, or they rely on media that are more difficult to analyze. It's just harder to analyze a set of pictures than it is to analyze text. We can't do that in any scale because we still don't have great machine learning algorithms uh, for analyzing pictures. It's getting better, um, but I do think that we should be cautious about preferencing one data set as if that's the one, uh, the only one where important things are happening, um, and when in fact uh, some of that is tied up in our ability to either uh, get the data to begin with or to engage with it um, in any meaningful way. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Set up my slides. All right. I think we have 15 minutes left too, is that right? Yeah? All right, I'm Michael Nelson, and um, this is joint with Herbert Van de Sample at Los Alamos and Michelle Weigel at Old Dominion. Let's see if the clicker works. So I'll begin with, what if I told you that there are other web archives, right? So our discussion in web archiving is dominated by the Internet Archive, which we all love. It's the biggest, it's the first. But there are other web archives. And one of the things I want us to think about is how do we leverage all of these different archives? So here's a service uh, developed at Los Alamos called timetravel.mementoweb.org. So we plug in BBC, here's a source of news, and we find it's archived in six different archives. So intuitively, this is better than just a single archive. Let's really explore why. Siegel's Law has come to web archiving. Siegel's Law says the man with two, watch, two watches doesn't know what time it is, right? As long as there was just one web archive, we could sort of agree, we kind of knew, okay, it's got some, uh, some biases and so forth, but that's our only source of data, so that's what we've got, right? When we start to have multiple archives, we have problems. Uh, how to resolve conflict, uh, conflicting issues in the archives, right? We no longer have the page, we have a page. It's personalized, there's GOYP. We can archive the same page at the same time and we'll get two totally different experiences. All right, so we understand that now. Let's fast forward 10 years and talk about how do we do analysis on the content that is in the web archives. So we have a, a short paper just looking at GOYP and some of the uh, other issues and trying to merge um, uh, the, what is in the existing archives and try and restitch it back together. A right. couple of examples of why we need multiple independent archives. First one is a single archive is vulnerable. You might remember this from uh, UK about three years ago where the conservative party there with the robots.txt essentially blocked out everything uh, all their pr prior speeches. They didn't want to you know, be on the record for all the stuff that they promised. So the Internet Archive, to avoid getting sued every 10 minutes, if you, your live robots.txt says you know, no to the Internet Archive agent, they'll redact the material in real time that they have. So that's what they did. And what they didn't count on was the cons they, the Conservative Party, that in fact there were multiple archives and they couldn't redact it from all. So this is clearly a good example of why having multiple copies is good. And actually when I was writing a post des uh, describing this effect, they actually switched their robots.txt. So in the middle of writing a blog post about it, I had to say, okay, two hours ago it looked like this, now it looks like that. And, but fortunately the robots.txt file is archived so we can talk about when they uh, switch back and forth. Right. I used to work at NASA, and so I, I'm allowed to say this. Um, so I call this the mommy dearest problem of preservation, right? So you can look at it and say, well, what about uh, memory organizations? They're, they're, they're supposed to hold on to the data. Those are the ones that we have to worry about the most, right? So NASA, they, <laughs> there was a problem with a Chinese contractor, and basically they shut down their public flow of information for, I don't know, six to 12 months, and then it just trickled back out. What they didn't know, and, and if you went to um, the digital library that I set up for them a long time ago, you got this nasty note saying, oh, we're, we're shutting it down until we figure things out. But 
a long time ago, I decided that NASA's information was too important to be left with NASA and figured out ways to push it out. And in this blog post describes about all the different locations where it existed, including uh, places outside the, uh, the US. All right. Here's an issue that we haven't really dealt with in web archiving, right? The, the right to be forgotten. This is a big, uh, big issue in the, in the EU. From my perspective, I, I, think this is a, I think this is a terrible idea. We'll get to that. But one of the things is it also bakes in the idea of Google as a source of discovery, which I'm really uncomfortable. Like, if I'm removed from Google, I, d I don't exist on the internet. No, you're removed from Google's indexes. But this issue has not come to web archiving. It's not because it's not relevant. It's because web archiving is not big enough to show up on their radar. That's going to change. In this election cycle, we're seeing more and more stories talking about web archiving and the role that it plays. So this is a problem that's coming. Now, I said, I'm not OK with this, but we already discussed this example from the Olympics and um, the Daily Beast publishing the thing. And then we redact it. And you'll see I have raw HTTP. I cannot give a presentation without raw HTTP. I won't go over it. But I feel better knowing it's behind me. OK. So um, then I checked in the time travel service. And it wasn't archived in other archives. And there was part of me that was like, oh, that's good. We don't want to out the people that, you know. And then there was a part of me that said, oh, crap. You know, I'm supposed to talk about multiple archives and how it's supposed to resist this level of censorship. But this is good censorship. So yay, boo. I don't know how I feel about it. But there it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we need all these extra archives. Who pays for these archives, right? So um, I don't know if any of you use the webcitation.org. It was one of the first uh, on-demand uh, web archiving services. And then they sort of um, had this um, NPR pledge drive kind of thing, you know, please give us money so we can keep operating with sort of an implied threat. And if you don't, you know, your data gets it. So, um, <laughs> But um, David Rosenthal has a really great blog. Right. So if you're not reading David Rosenthal's blog, you need to go read his blog. He had just amazing stuff in there. But basically, he has a really good argument that endowing a terabyte, right? If you're at a university, you want to endow a terabyte, costs about $4,700, right? And it gets to the issue that you were talking about, right? Yet you think, well, I can get a flash drive for really cheap. And so, but who's going to sit there and plug new flash drives in while, you know, when the, when the media dies? So we can actually put a cost on how long we want to hold on or how much it costs to hold on to this, not even in perpetuity, but for a long time. It's a ton of money, right? So even though things are cheap, they stay uh, very expensive. And the other thing I want to mention is, Web archives aren't magic sites, right? So uh, lots of people say, oh, I put it in a web archive. Done. It's solved, right? No, you, a web archive is just a website. Websites change all the time. There is this great service called Mummify. Does anyone remember that? Probably not, right? It's dead. Um, <laughs> and if you go there, um, so this, this page is actually old. It actually now sells shoes in Italy, right? And so that's fine. But it wanted you to rewrite your links. And what it would do is, if you rewrote your link, it would see if the live website was still there, and then it redirects you to that so you didn't lose uh, you know, page rank or traffic or something. And then if it died, you'd go to the archive version. But nobody built in the idea of, well, what happens when the Mummify link dies, and then I've lost all the semantics, right? So that's a legitimate link that I created, but there's no way to figure out how to find that in the web archives, right? So we have a solution called Robust Links, and basically we were trying to inject some additional semantics into the HTML so you can recover information. Now, the second time I want to mention David Rosenthal's blog has really good argument for, in the paper-based world, we increase, we get economic value by increasing the number of copies, right? I sold more stuff. In the web-based world, we get economic value by reducing the number of copies. So therein is the tension, right? We want to have lots of copies so that we can hold on to it, but the people who pay for everything have a monetary interest in reducing the number of copies. All right. <laughs> So we'll use the cloud, right? OK, we'll use the cloud. Um, this is where we remind you the cloud is just someone else's computer, right? <laughs> really, if someone comes into your office and says, oh, we'll use the cloud, you really need to send them out right away because that's probably not the right solution for the kinds of problems that we have, right? So why should we be concerned about relying on other people's services? So here's a BBC page from a while back. This is about the Arab Spring. And it talks about um, one of the, the landmark tweets and photos. And when we go to visit the tweet, her account shut down. There used to be, um, and the TwitPic um, image associated is gone as well. 
There used to be a service called Topsy, and this was a commercial company that effectively archived all your tweets. So even though her account was shut down, we could see the tweet, we could see the image, and at this point, history is preserved. Not necessarily anonymized, but preserved. We come back later, and it's gone. Apple bought Topsy like Apple likes to do. I mean, I love Apple, right? Apple likes to buy things and kill them. Um, so we lose Topsy altogether. And then when we go to the web archive, it redirects us to, at first, an Apple tech support page about buy some crap. And now when we go and visit topsy.com, there's actually no server there, which means there's no HTTP event, which means it doesn't even register as a thing in the web archives, because web archives ultimately record what an HTTP server told us, but if no one's there to answer the phone, right, we, we, we don't record anything. This is the graph that Ed talked about. Going back, um, I, had a, uh, I had an Egyptian student who was really interested in this as it was occurring in the Arab Spring. Um, and basically, we are losing resources embedded in social media, not just the tweets themselves, but the things they link to, the images, the articles, the videos, and so forth. 11% the first year and about 7% each year after that. And we're losing things faster than we archive them. This material is not normally archived, right? So when we test how much of the stuff is archived, we're like, oh, look at CNN, look at apple.com. Oh, it's there, we're good. But random tweet, random image, almost surely not archived. And we're losing this amount of history. You remember in the Malaysian Flight 17 from a couple years ago, right? So here's a translated page where the Russian guy says, hey, we shot down a plane. Um, you click on the video, and that's not really archived. That's a whole other discussion. Our archives are actually filled with holes. Ilya's going to talk about how to help fill some of those holes, but we can't go back in time and fill those holes. So we don't really have the video, but that's our, our web archiving dirty little secret, right? So here's a thread where Ed and I discuss um, who has what copies, which is great because we're like, oh, I'll, we archive this page, and there's more than one copy, and they're in different archives, but they're not actually independent copies. They're actually copies of the same copy, so we don't resolve that. And then, so I posted something, pat, you know, patted myself on the break, hooray, web archiving, you know, we expose those bad guys. And this guy, Alex, whatever, says, um, you know, oh, a perfect tool to produce evidence of any kind. Who would care about reliability? So, I mean, now we check on that, Alex is 404, right? He deleted his account. Maybe that's a good thing, but we've lost this guy's perspective on history. And in fact, you can't even go back and verify that Alex actually said that. You have to trust me that Alex said that, right? So, I mean, trust me, I'm telling you the truth, but we can't reproduce this material, right? And then we have to really ask, do we have the perfect tool to produce evidence of any kind, right? So this is one of the things where I'm concerned I want to archive these things and hold on to them because I envision a future in which we produce evidence as needed to justify anything we want, right? So you may have uh, saw this, it was a battle between uh, two people. Um, Astro Katie is a popular astrophysicist in Australia. So um, talks about climate change and a uh, conservative uh, activist said, oh, it's a scam and so forth. You should you know, read the science. And she says, um, you know, look, I already have a PhD in astrophysics. Get off my back, right? <laughs> and so it was funny. It was retweeted a gazillion times. It's hilarious, right? He got smacked around. It's great. Mm -hmm. What we can't prove is that he didn't say something else, right? Maybe he said, oh, you should listen to Nickelback. And if you had an MFA in music, you know how great they are. And then she says that, right? That didn't really happen, but can you tell the difference, right? What if I changed it so where she admits, yeah, you busted, I'm, I'm part of the big scam, and I'm being paid by all the you know, bad guys du jour or something like that. I can make up anything you want. And if you're not archiving their tweets, how can, how can you refute me, right? So at some point, I'm tired of being an underpaid professor. I'm going to turn evil and just manufacture, uh, I'm going to be like you know, the doctors that you know, told you smoking was good in the 50s. I'm going to crank out uh, you know, web archives for all the bad guys. I'm going to be rich. It's going to be good. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll meet on the field of battle in 10 years or something like that. But I'm just telling you right now, I'm giving you a head start. Um, <laughs> so also on the uh, point that Brooke made, um, that uh, Mutt and Jeff was the origin of this great thing of, you know, why are you looking over here? Well, I didn't lose my money here. The light's better there. This is where we ask, hey, Twitter, do you realize there's a flood happening in Louisiana? 
Now, if you're looking at Twitter for one thing, that's fine, but if you're looking at Twitter to be representative of what's happening in the world, realize Twitter doesn't know that there's a flood happening, right? There's a lot of first person evidence happening, a lot of interesting things happening here. This is a problem we have to face, right? And this is a web archiving problem because, well, we don't collect it because it's hard and we don't analyze it because it's hard, but that's where mom and dad and grandparents are discussing things, things that are, are relevant to them. So summary, Siegel's Law, multiple archives as a solution. The Memento Web Project addresses that. If you want to talk about archival verifiability, we actually have a Mellon Foundation project just started a couple months after uh, this project, and we're actively working on this issue of how, to, how can we prove that this web archive or this material hasn't been altered in public web archives. Thank you. Thanks. So I saw a sign at the back saying we were done. Um, we which, I think it was I was done. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> but let's do, let's do a question. I mean, <laughs> we could do one question. I mean, I, I guess I, I kind of well, Dan, go ahead. Give a point of information. Yeah. Uh, you asked how we were getting around the, the JSON delivery question, and we're not. Uh, that is not a public server, and you are not third parties. I, we're not publishing it. I, I, I figured that was the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was there as a like a as a provocation, right, to yeah. this actual discussion. Yeah. Um, Great. I, maybe this is opening up a like Pandora's box at the, at the end, like when there's no time. But I, I really wanted to connect it back to the ethics discussion. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think Brooke, your question uh, during that about sort of the tension between doing your analysis right as a scientist, you know, on social networks, right, is sort of in tension with with um, with this ethical question of. You know, do we have consent from these content creators that it, you know, ultimately they are the owners of this content that they're putting out onto the web, and um, and sort of like this this balancing act, right? Between it, it seemed like, I mean, I guess I'm sort of projecting my own answer here a little bit, but like, but it, it seems like there's a space in between, right? Like where, like you're able to do. I mean, th does this make sense? Where you're able to do the work that you do. Uh, you know, as a researcher, but when it comes to actually publishing out to the world you, the results of your work, that, that at that point, very similar to um, what Dean, you did what, with your beyond the hashtags, right? It's at that point when you decide on what that, what that presentation is gonna be that these ethical issues kind of come into play. Mm -hmm. I, is, that, is that unsatisfying to, um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think I agree with you in large part. Like the the actual risk happens at the point of broader dissemination. Mm -hmm. um, although, I think that that a little bit it's a little bit uh, kind of pushes the laziness into a different space, right? So, yeah. so I yeah, I wear a big hat as a social scientist and a tiny hat as a computer scientist. So I interlope in their conferences sometimes. Um, and I think one of the frustrations, and there's growing recognition in the computer science community, but one of the frustrations is the idea that like algorithms are inherently ethical or neutral on ethics, you know, or mm -hmm. things like, like I said, you know, so the way the way we identify the most important Twitter uh, tweeter, uh, it, it, you know, that is inherently an ethical question too. So I hesitate to kind of say like, look, it's you know, Sarah, it's basically your decision, right? <laughs> like you're the qualitative one, so you decide how we're going to handle this. Uh, I think it also comes, it needs to get pushed down into the analysis point. Even if that part doesn't actually expose the risk, it creates the possibility of exposure. Right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, let's, sorry there wasn't more time for questions. Um, we'll be here all day. Yeah. <laughs>